Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully, you can all hear me okay. Sorry for the delay. Uh, we're just uh, uh, sadly taking a few photographs out the back uh, to, uh, to document uh, this, uh, what's promised to be a really interesting uh, uh, afternoon. So, my name's Herb Kim. Uh, I live here in Liverpool, um, uh, but I'm a chief executive of a company based over in Gateshead. Uh, it's called CodeWorks, uh, and uh, I've become best known for running a conference called the Thinking Digital Conference. And uh, but luckily, uh, the good people, in fact, um, uh, invited me to to help chair today's uh, uh, Roy Stringer lecture. So to kick things off, we have the chief executive of the Foundation for Art and Creative Technology, Mike Stubbs. And Mike, if you're ready, then. all right. Good to see you. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, Welcome to FACT. Um, this is a special occasion for us today because obviously Roy Stringer was the founding chair of FACT um, long before this fantastic building existed. Um, someone I personally knew some 20 years back, we were just reminiscing outside um, because we do have people from Amaze, which was the company he founded here in Liverpool. Um, today's event is of particular resonance to FACT because I think that you know, uh, our keynote speaker today uh, is very, very much in tune with our agenda. Um, and I guess what we want to talk about is the difference that the web, the internet, creative technologies can make on people's lives, um, individually and as a society. And of course, there's all, you know, there's several of us, I'm sure, tweeting away right now. Uh, uh, alignment with society is as much to do with our virtual presence as it is in, in terms of the physical world. Um, so it's very, very important to us. Um, likewise, there are some fairly kind of astounding facts which need addressing, especially in this city where something like 100,000 members of the Liverpool Society don't have access to the internet, which is a shocking number when you consider our population is 435,000. And I think that represents, actually, across the nation, something like 9 million people as part of the national population which don't have access to the internet. Therefore, today's event was born out of uh, Martha's attendance as part of uh, Go On Liverpool and Race Online, which obviously is a, a fantastic campaign which we are strongly backing. Um, I will also say I'm digital, I'm Liverpool. Um, we've got John here, who's obviously been heading that up. Um, and of course, a lot of the work the FACT does is around education, collaboration and outreach. Um, and today we've got Patrick Fox, who will be um, contributing from the collaborations team here at FACT. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, and now I actually want to encourage you to get involved with the Race Online campaign. Um, and I think that we're actually asking people to give an hour of their time to encourage people who don't have access to the internet or need help or could just use, you know, just use a bit of encouragement to spend more time online because it will become increasingly important that if you're engaged in society and decision making that you feel comfortable and at home within those environments. So that's Go on Liverpool. Um, so now I'd like to uh, introduce Nat from a maze and hand over to you. I hope you enjoy the afternoon. Um, I think Martha's going to run off, but there are going to be people around at the end for more of, a, more of an informal conversation at the end. So over to Nat. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, welcome to today's Roy Stringer's uh, lecture. It's an event that we at Amaze are delighted to sponsor. Just a very quick introduction um, to Amaze. Um, we are a marketing and technology business, and as um, Mike said, we were founded by Roy back in 1995. We were actually founded out of the Learning Methods Unit of Liverpool John Moores University, and at that point, Roy set up the business to explore the impact of digital on learning and communication. Um, and that thinking about the internet as a new medium with a very far-reaching impact on the way we all live our lives remains very much at the heart of, of Amaze today. Um, our 200-strong team work with businesses that include Toyota, Lexus, Unilever, Coca-Cola, um, Odeon Cinemas, BBC, and Keep Britain Tidy. Um, and very much alongside and feeding into our commercial work, we have a very strong focus on research. 
So we have um, what we call the Amazed Generation, which is a group of young people aged between um, 11 and 14 that we follow year on year to really get inside their heads and understand how digital is changing their lives and how it's changing their social interactions. We also work with a number of universities sponsoring research into understanding not what people do on the internet, but why they do it, really getting under the skin of why people behave how they behave online. We also have in our team a number of digital artists, uh, Danny Brown, who uh, was actually uh, a prodigy of Roy's um, and is a leading light in, in the digital creative industries, um, and also Alistair, who, um, who is in the audience today, um, and he's recently exhibited at FACT uh, with a project, Me, You and Us, um, and is really enjoying a lot of success in the digital industry. And I think in terms of some of the changes that we're seeing, we're delighted that we've just taken on uh, an executive producer for content who we've... Um, uh, who has been one of the most successful producers of um, some of our biggest primetime TV shows um, over the last five or ten years has just joined us because the internet is, is finally ready um, for great content. So in terms of what we're seeing in the industry, two key changes that we're certainly facing and, 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 and grappling with is HTML5 and mobile. And, and we believe that that's going to be really disruptive in terms of the new uh, possibilities that opens up. Uh, both in terms of access but in terms of creativity. So we think it's a really, really exciting time for this next stage of the internet and really ties in nicely to today's event, uh, the democratizing role of the web and how do we ensure that everyone can benefit from the good bits that we know of the internet today. And I think because of the speed of uh, technology change, because of the need to understand how that's impacting um, society and human behavior, the need to connect people online, and the need for creativity to create a driver to do that, um, that joining up public sector and private sector, our uh, educational and training institutions, and of course the creative industries, is more pertinent and more relevant and necessary now, probably more than ever before. Um, and I know that in the audience, each of those sectors will be represented, and of course our fantastic panel today um, really do come from all of those walks of life, so I'm really hopeful we're going to have a great event today. Um, I'd like to finish with a quote from Roy back in 2001, which I think is uh, fitting for today's event, and that is, um, every medium from print to film is screening, screaming out for unique digital content that can be called fine literature. I believe that the emergent order will be the inevitable result of efforts by artists rather than technocrats. Thank you for your time today and enjoy the event. Okay. Right, thanks to Mike and, and to Natalie for kicking us off. So just in terms of uh, some, just some timings here, so uh, I think the event will uh, go on for until about 4.30 or so. Uh, for about an hour uh, and a bit, um, and and we're going to go ahead and just go ahead and pretty much just kick off uh, with the discussion. Uh, instead of given the structure of this theater, it's going to be difficult to uh, sort of uh, pass around mics and things like that. So I would, as as questions arise, uh, I'm not a big fan of sort of having a specific section that says, "Okay, audience, now it's your turn," sort of thing. Simply raise your hand. I will try to my best to sort of stop the discussion, and, and we'll take questions as we go along. And simply, what we'll do is encourage you to shout loud, and, and if it needs reprojecting by myself, I'll go ahead and reproject your question to the, for the benefit of the, of the, of the whole audience. Uh, we're going to lose Martha in about a half an hour or so, I think, unfortunately, ish. For, so, 4.15, okay, cool. And Peter as well. Okay, sorry. Okay, so, uh, so yes, you'll so you'll have to please accept their apologies in advance. They, at some point, they will simply have to exit stage left. And um, right, and so um, I will go ahead and, and, and introduce um, our panel, if that's okay. So starting to the right, we've got Patrick Fox, um, who uh, is uh, here with at Fact, where he does a lot of work uh, in community development uh, across a variety of different communities and projects, and uh, should have a, so, some very relevant experience there for us today. Uh, next to him is John Egan, uh, who's with Aurora Media, uh, who have been the creative agency behind the It's Liverpool campaign that you've uh, already heard Mike mention a couple of times. Uh, next is Nat, who of course you're familiar with now, hopefully. Uh, Andy Mia, uh, who's based here in Liverpool, uh, although is with the University of the West of Scotland, formerly, is that right? Uh, and perhaps uh, if you read his, uh, his bio, it's, it's clear he has a lot of different interests, but perhaps an expert in emerging technologies will be the, the easiest way to, uh, to, to describe uh, Andy's, uh, Andy's background. 
Um, I'll, I'll skip Martha for a second and, and come on to Peter, who, uh, who is with the, he's the head of PR uh, at Google currently, although formerly was the editor of, uh, of the BBC program Newsnight. Is that, uh, have I got that right? Fantastic. So, uh, honored to have him here as well. And then, of course, uh, Martha Lane Fox, who many of you will hopefully know, was uh, the, the co-founder of LastMinute.com. Uh, I was uh, in, a, in, a, in a related uh, .com called QXL.com, which shares some common heritage which with Last Minute as well. So it's, it's great to reconnect with, uh, with Martha today. Uh, in her, uh, since then, uh, she's uh, gone on to um, uh, found and, and chair uh, uh, a karaoke business in, in London called uh, Lucky Voice. Uh, in, her, in, her, in her other time, she uh, does things like uh, be a, a, is a non-executive director for Channel 4 uh, and Marks and Spencers. Uh, and of course, uh, has been the UK's uh, original digital inclusion champion, which I discovered today since 2009, but now formerly the UK's digital champion. Uh, and um, I think uh, what I'll do at this point, if, if that's okay, is I'll move over to the, to the chair. It'll be slightly a friendlier angle to speak with the panel. And move the chair over here. Have you got me? Okay, great. Uh, and so I think um, it's uh, entirely appropriate to begin a discussion about the democratizing influence of the web with, with, uh, uh, with a question to you, Martha, with regard to the fact that I mean, you're literally democratizing the web in, in your work in the sense of almost a person-by-person -person campaign to, to bring people on and, and convince them to the benefits. And um, so one, 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 the, the first thing that struck me is that uh, obviously whenever a, a, a new government comes in, particularly one as different as the old Labour government and the, and the new coalition government, they usually like to throw everything out uh, of what the old folks did and, and, and obviously bring in, bring in a, a new guard, if you will. So uh, I was fascinated to see how did you manage to convince David, Cameron and others to, uh, to say, no, this, this is really important. We need to keep uh, not, the work, not just the work, but, but myself as well. So what was that process like? Um, I didn't convince them that they should keep me, but I did convince them that they should keep the issue right at the heart of what they were doing and did that very simple mechanism which was talking to both sides from the very first day I said yes to the job. So for me it was completely a political subject. Should we encourage at that point the ten and a half million people who'd never used the internet to try and get online? Yes. It doesn't seem to me that that's too controversial and shouldn't get too party political. And what we tried to do very early on was also build a very strong economic case around it, which hadn't really been done before. So we worked with PwC to uh, come up with a value of £22 billion to the UK economy if all those people were brought online. That's through more people getting jobs, through more people getting better results in education, through more people uh, creating businesses and so on. So the kind of combination of uh, charm offensive across the parties, shall we say, and a really strong economic case, I hope, meant that it was detoxified. It wasn't anything to do with any one party. Okay. And, I mean, obviously, um, I think most of the audience will know uh, a lot of your history and things. And, you know, uh, I would imagine you would be spoiled for choice as to what, how to spend your time kind of thing. And I, I, I'm curious as to what was the inspiration at a personal level, because I'm sure having to work even if you were welcomed by the by the coalition government, uh, just having to work with a different group of people meant a, a number of you know it, it's it, it would be a difficult battle. And so, what 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 drives you? What inspires you? What motivates you to not only to do this but to continue doing this? Um, well, I think it's probably three or four different things. But I was, I was laughing when I was looking at I was coming to talk to you guys because you probably think, how can a woman who's founded an e-commerce company have any sympathy around creativity at all? Because, you know, that's pretty much just about transactions and getting people to buy stuff. But I would like to reveal to you that the early days of lastminute.com were extremely creative, from the creative way we handle customer service through to the creative stories I made up about my friends going on holiday pretending they were customers, through to the uh, creative way which we were writing new bits of technology, because at that point there was no Google, no Facebook, no Twitter, nothing. Uh, to do with any of the technologies that probably seem as though they're just part of our fabric. And I mention that because 
way back then we were on a big mission to convince people that the internet was something valuable, that it was going to be here to stay, and that it was going to create uh, excitement, wealth, opportunity, jobs, uh, interest, and all of the things that we know happened now, back in 2000, uh, sorry, even pre-2000, 1997. So I'd kind of been an internet evangelist back then, and I was a bit surprised when I ended up in 2009-10 going back to some of those basics and spending a lot of time both in government government, convincing government the internet really was a channel they should take seriously, but also um, convincing uh, on a much bigger scale than many millions of people who hadn't yet seen its benefits. So I guess, you know, there's a big link there. And then, as you may have seen me walking in, wobbling in, I had a very, very serious car accident in 2004, and I uh, was in hospital for two years. And when you are completely unable to live as you were used to, despite having every resource and help you could possibly imagine, um, being able to use the internet when I'm the most vulnerable person you could possibly encounter incredibly vulnerable that really taught me from another perspective the value of some of this stuff so I guess both personally and professionally it was something that I have really been delighted to be involved in. So with the, the new campaign it, it seems that it's it's sort of striking quite a different approach and, and to some extent mobilizing the population or at least parts of the population to, and that's just what again what was the inspiration to say, not, not so much break with the past, but effectively launch almost a, what, quite a different and, and really quite a radical, diff, a very different, but actually in some ways fairly resonant with what, what, the, what, the, what the new government would, would, would perhaps appreciate. But I was just wondering what was the, again, what, what, what happened? Well, it's, it's been the genesis of a whole bunch of stuff. I wasn't given any money to do the task of encouraging the entire country to use the internet. So we've always been trying to work through partners and through other people's resources. And we've kind of focused on three things, really. I'll come back to the thing that we're doing most at the moment. But the broad reasons why people aren't online are they don't see any benefit in it for them. That is by far and away the biggest reason. They've got no idea that there is something in it for them. So we just part that for a moment. The second reason is a perception of price and the third reason is because they just don't know how to, they don't have access, they don't know where in their community. So we've been working with hardware suppliers to create much cheaper products and services. We've got uh, two particularly good deals, one that Microsoft has created, £95 for a recycled PC uh, if you're on benefits. I lost my shoes, sorry. And, um, uh, a bunch of broadband support and uh, kind of telephone support in that as well. Once One with Remploy for £92 as well, recycled computer. So that's the kind of price part. The um, bit around having access, we've worked very hard with lots of big national partners to help open up infrastructure in surprising places. So whether it's post offices, whether it's schools, whether it's your local pub, whether it's your local bingo hall, to make sure anywhere where there's a computer, you have the opportunity to have a go on it, as opposed to having to go to somewhere that looks a bit scary, like a computer centre. But the first part, um, which is about that inspiration, that benefits piece, is the bit that I think I feel most strongly about, because it feels like the easiest bit to crack because you will all know because it's part of your daily life as it is for the 30 million people in the country who use the internet every day that it's not one thing that is wonderful about being online for me it's one thing for my dad it's another thing only recently I have to tell you for you Herb it will be something else for the people I met today in Liverpool it's something else again so we figure just trying to unlock that individual peer-to-peer -peer, not training in every single thing about a computer but inspiration to get over that first hurdle is one of the biggest battles so that's what that kind of given our digital champions initiative is really about Okay, great. And it's just, just, just a quick follow-up. I mean, is there a classic, in terms of basically making it practical for people who are, I'll let you get your shoe. <laughs> is, uh, is there, I mean, is it, is it literally just down to individuals out there just thinking of literally about someone they know? And I guess in your case, I mean, what, so what was, it, was your father, is your, is your father literally a non-user of the, of the internet? He is literally a non-user of the internet, and I think the more that I have got involved in technology in the last 15 years, the more he has refused to get online, and uh, he would absolutely, no way was he ever going to buy anything off lastminute.com, and subsequently, you know, when the dot-com bubble, the share price went up, share price went down, I told you so, all this stuff. Um, so he has been a refusenik until the last two weeks when uh, not only did I show him pictures of himself online, as the vainest man in the world, that was quite exciting, but also uh, people reviewing his books, that was also pretty exciting, and mainly his grandsons, so yes. But it took time and it's hard.
it's, it's obviously the campaign's had, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, very public support. Uh, obviously, the BBC ran its uh, Given Hour campaign recently, uh, which has started recently, although it continues. Um, and obviously, I guess uh, folks like Google and, and many others will be getting up. So for, if I remember correctly from, from the stats that were given, is it is it 8.7? So roughly 20% of the population is yeah, totally adult, offline. Adult population, yeah. And um, it's split kind of broadly. Uh, about 60% of that number are over 65, and half that number are also people that fall into three or more multiple deprivation indices. And that's the killer bit, really, isn't it? Because not only do you have people who are probably heavily excluded anyway, you know, I've visited so many places where you know, bus routes have just been stopped, schools have been shut down, libraries have been shut down, and this is you know, over the last 10 years, not just the last two years. So people who are physically excluded but also um, digitally excluded and that means that you really have no to tools at your disposal to be able to help just empower your life in very small ways. Actually Patrick this would be a good time to, to bring you in in terms of, I mean Martha brings up a very good point which is that um, the, the, the problem with perhaps reaching some of these people is that they're, they're outside of the, the normal ways that, that people might you know, get connected and, and into, if you will. And I guess a, a lot of your work is also, again, dealing with parts of the population that might not normally access the arts. And, and part of it must be also be trying to sell, if you will, or convince them of the benefits of something that might seem quite uh, ephemeral or, or relatively uh, unuseful given the challenges of the day life. So what, what, what's the work that you're doing to sort of, you know, connect people into the arts? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, you know, factors and organisations in a really fortunate position because, we, you know, as we're a cultural institution, but we also work with technology on a daily basis. So part of our kind of bread and butter is to reach those communities that would not necessarily use a building like this or, or access them, um, you know, new media artwork. So, so I think I'm really interested in, in the idea of cultural institutions really taking, taking on board this campaign and support, you know, through those different entry points. And, you know, the some of the work that we've been doing over the years, one particular project, which is probably the most relevant to today's conversation, is a project called Tenant Spin, which is the oldest um, internet television channel in, in the world, and it started here in Liverpool in 1999, and it's a project that continues today. And, and that was a partnership between the social housing sector, social, you know, um, the social housing tenants across Merseyside, and an arts organisation, and, and a visiting artist collector from Denmark. And that idea was this notion of using the internet to create a kind of new public sphere around a kind of change process that was, that was happening within the community. Um, you know, and that was a really successful project and, and has, you know, has lived on you know, 12 years later. So I think that idea of, of kind of cross-sector partnership or of the kind of cultural um, experience as an entry point and as a kind of, you know, you know it's well documented the impact of, of cultural experience and, and cultural participation on, on communities or individuals. You know, we've got all the kind of evidence and proof that suggests that this is, you know, it's a positive thing. I think when you combine that with a really functional tool within, within daily life, which in this particular instance was, was a regeneration program around social housing um, and that kind of need within the community, you know, you can see fantastic things begin to, begin to flourish really. Um, and, you know, and that kind of led us as an organisation to, to kind of explore that in all areas of our, our kind of programmes of work. And, you know, in 2009, we, we felt compelled to, to, to publish a digital manifesto around older people and technology to kind of use some of the knowledge base that we had, we had kind of um, brought together over that 12 year period and kind of, you know, use it as a, as a kind of rally call really to the cultural sector and say, you know, this is, this is something that we can really connect to as an agenda. So the things like Go On at Liverpool and, and, and the Race Online, is it absolutely resonates with the yeah, essential mission. Yeah, absolutely. So, so is the byproduct of your work then that people are adopting technology who are Absolutely. I mean, we, we, you know, if we're working with, with, you know, an artist and they're working with a particular community group, you know, some of the tools that they use or the kind of vehicles that they use to explore their creativity will, will be technology because of the nature of the organisation that we use. And some of the byproducts that we see of that will be people adopting Skype to talk to their grandkids or talk to family members abroad, or they might be interested in suddenly, well, how can I pay my rent online? Or, you know, my, my, my son wants to look for a job, so I'm going to get him, you know, search for jobs online or do my online shopping. Or so a variety of different things that you know are not the kind of original intention of the project projects that we, we initiate but are actually natural byproducts really so yeah I mean I, I, are you seeing this kind of thing with with other institutions you're working with yeah I, I would uh, like to bottle what you guys do and just manage to push in some even more resources and pop out even more because I uh, that wasn't the right an analogy at all was it that didn't make any sense but anyway you got what I meant I think it's brilliant and I've I've seen kind of 
so many different uh, angles of this, you know, whether it's been kids who had really uh, completely shocking times and have got their lives back together because they've learned to do online music and then they've learned to sell bits of that music and become DJs and taught other kids or whether it's a fabulous project that's in Noel West in the middle of Bristol. Noel West is a really tough ward and uh, they built a media centre and when I was going there I was thinking, really, a media centre in the middle of this place? Is that really what they need most? Completely phenomenal. The kids were teaching the grandparents to do stuff and they were recording it online and they were sharing all this stuff and the grandparents thought they were teaching the kids to grow vegetables but actually it was all part of some big crazy internet project. So many any byproducts out of it. But the thing I think I've learnt um, myself more than anything is that it makes me really makes me really angry that we say, you know, why bother with these nine million people? You know, won't technology sort it out? Or won't you know these people? You know, do they really need it? Absolute nonsense. Because everybody has some kind of creativity within them. That this is the lowest risk and easiest way and cheapest way to unlock that potential. Whether it's just posting a memory, through to starting a small business, through to something bigger and grander. And there is nobody for which that's not true. And that's why I think we really need to put real resource and momentum behind it. Absolutely. Well, I mean, Andy and I were talking uh, previous to this uh, with regard to, uh, I mean, there are, there, are, there, are, there are literally so many different arguments as to, as to why this is important, but one of them uh, that we talked about is just simply, and not just in the UK, but around the world, this, the, the, the aging population um, that we've got, and the, the, frankly, the cost of providing health care, or providing various services to that population. Uh, as well as the fact that also uh, because of all the great science and research that's happening, that population is also getting older faster, in a sense, uh, and that it's, um, it's, it's, it's part of the, I mean, it's a big part of the issue. I don't know if that's something that, again, that you guys have... Yeah, it's completely unrelated to age in my experience. It's to do with your mental kind of state and your state of mind. You know, there's a link, I was talking about it earlier on the BBC, they found a 104-year-old person who's become one of our digital champions who's been teaching 85-year-olds how to use the internet. I mean, that's so fantastic. And uh, something that we go back to a lot uh, in the team is that there are, I think it's, I think this number's right, three and a half million people who are over 65 and see nobody in a week. No one. No human contact at all. And there are shocking 1.7 million older people who see nobody in a month. And yet you've got to believe that being able to take part in some kind of conversation using the internet is better than being completely alone. We know that when you're online you feel less isolated and less vulnerable and your confidence goes up marginally. Of course it doesn't replace that face-to-face -face contact, but you know, it sure as hell is better than being completely alone. So Peter, let me, I mean obviously, um, uh, I mean, Google are obviously a relatively well-known uh, firm these days. <laughs> uh, I, you know, uh, what's, what's, I mean, what's, what's the world, I mean, why are you guys getting so involved in, in this particular? Yeah, well, we've niche. been working very, very closely with, with Martha on this. Uh, really, the, our part of the, of the equation is, is trying to get businesses online. So we've been in, in Liverpool today uh, visiting the, the juice bar, which at the moment is in, in Toxted Library. Um, and the juice bar has been travelling around uh, Liverpool and the, the, the suburbs in, in recent weeks. We're here between uh, September and Christmas, really trying to encourage businesses that don't have a presence online or have a, a minimal presence online to, to improve their presence. Uh, and we've, we've got uh, graduates, uh, computer graduates, uh, some of whom we met today, who are basically helping uh, businesses to, to, uh, to get online and, and, uh, and, and show them the tools for how to do better. So we met, for example, uh, this afternoon, a, a couple who run a, a martial arts business. And they don't have a website, but they're obviously keen to get the word out about their martial arts business. And we were setting them up with a, a, a Google Places page so that they could uh, get the word out about their business. So that's really what, what, why we are involved. And, and our, our figures sort of match up very neatly with, with Martha's. We, we did a study recently which, which demonstrated that the, the internet economy in Britain is worth about 100 billion pounds. Uh, it's about 8% of the economy at the moment, and that's growing quite quite fast. But obviously the businesses who aren't on online are really in, in grave danger of, of missing out. So the businesses who do have an online presence are growing about four times as much, right. four times as fast as businesses who go aren't online. So there's sort of a commercial digital divide happening as well. Well, that's, that's, that's obviously the danger, yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, obviously one of the... the um, one of the one of the big innovations uh, that we've seen uh, since uh, I guess about 2007 is the explosion in, in the smartphone business. 
uh, and obviously Android have become uh, bigger and bigger, and depending on how you measure it, uh, increasing the dominant uh, player in, with regard to smartphone software. Um, I, and I, I obviously don't have access to usage stats uh, the, uh, of Google Android, but I, are you starting? To, are you seeing a lot of people that were perhaps not adopted? Mike seems to be going for time. So, you know, I mean, I think this is a very, very important area, and I think particularly in the in the the area of those who are marginalised from the web. So, and this isn't just Britain. This is, I think, the world. So, you you are going to see a generation of users who come to smartphones perhaps without even ever owning a PC a computer at all, and the potential for that is really extraordinary. Because I mean, I mean, here's the here I've got one. I mean, it's not a phone at all. Is it? It's effectively a supercomputer connected to the cloud, which, which can, can uh, rely on, on, on all the, the computing power that's available. And that basically means a situation where you could have large uh, swathes of the population who are going from ha having no information at all mm. to having most of the world's information in their pocket. Mm. And you, you, you keep seeing Mary Meeker's projections about the, the, the take-up of uh, of, of mobile phones and they keep being toppled like, like dominoes because they, things are moving even faster than being, is being predicted but I think certainly within the next couple of years mobile devices will be the primary way of accessing the internet which is a huge huge potential for okay. democratization right okay so I mean is that uh, I mean ultimately will we see the, the growth of, of smartphones and whatnot as being hopefully a, a one of the devices that, that help to get people online then yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's globally. I mean, if you look at the potential in the developing world, it's really quite extraordinary. So, so at the moment, cr across Africa, uh, in countries like Kenya, so South Africa, you know, internet penetration very low, but mobile phone penetration quite high. And as those those guys uh, get new phones, the, t the tendency to move towards smartphones is, is quite big. The, the price of smartphones is falling all the time. Mm -hmm. You're going to see a whole generation of people getting online without ever having a computer. Okay. Um, so, Nat and Andy, we were talking uh, before about how bizarrely, in some ways, the modern web browser is a is a, is a digital inclusion innovation in the sense that before the modern web, web browser, there were obviously there was all this internet stuff out there, but not a lot of people were necessarily using it. Um, and so, uh, uh, given given the work that, that you guys are involved in doing, and that you mentioned HTML5 a couple of times, uh, and, and Andy, I know you're working on also. Are, are there other things that are perhaps around the corner that are going to help again make the web that much more accessible, either for the population that's already using it, or perhaps more relevant to this to the non-adoptive population that you guys see? I don't know if either wants to take a crack first. What I think is always interesting about these debates is the language that we use to describe them. I was having a conversation with my aunt the other day about the cloud, explaining to her what this is, and she said, well, I've never seen anything on the weather in the evening news, so you know, it can't be happening yet. But it seems to me that one of the, one of the problematic terms is the digital divide, which is never, a concept I've never really liked. But it seems one thing that is very real uh, when people get online is the digital literacy gap, the gap between the knowledge that people have and the knowledge that's required for adopting new platforms, which I think is something that persists for many people's use of, of not just the internet, on their telephones or on their computers, but also their new televisions. You know, I wonder how many people will, on the digital switchover coming very soon, will lose television and hopefully be online perhaps instead, because this is something that people are going to have to deal with. But in terms of what people um, are, are going to use, I think, in the future, I think still people are are not, around 50% of people have smartphones now. I read a stat today that said that. And it seems to me that people still don't really use them to their max. So I wonder how many of you here are using a range of, of functions other than just the telephone on your, on your own mobile phone. It seems to me one of the big challenges is still to get the most out of the technology that we have already today. And there's still a great deal of work, I think, that we can do in that respect. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd probably add to that in that a lot of the work we do is obviously with very large brands and, and what they're grappling with is change, change, change all the time. But we are still sort of dealing with um, browser and also with mobile is like how can they use mobile to reach their customers and I think that the general public isn't moving quite as quick as we all are in terms of our knowledge and what we're doing. So I absolutely agree getting the best out of the technologies to reach public. Uh, the public is, is absolutely key um, for that and, and we are you know, we, we work a lot to understand why do people use devices and really understanding, you know, in, in particular communities, why isn't the internet working for them? And I think 
the danger is that we treat people en masse rather than ethnographic study as well as statistical study is to really get under the skin of, of, of the issues and what people are wanting and that is a that that's quite a lot of the work that we do. And I think we're absolutely, you know, focused on mobile um, because clearly a lot of people use mobile as smartphones penetrate deeper than then perhaps that is an area that we should be looking very much and I'd be very fascinated to know of the 8.7, how mobile plays 8.7 million, how mobile plays a part in actually bring, bringing people to use digital applications, but in context. So, as part of shopping, as part of their experiences. I mean, one of the brands we're working with at the moment is a is a, uh, a wool maker, um, and so uh, they're very much about crafts. And obviously, very large there's very large knitting communities out there. And the reason why people buy particular wool is because they um, they want the patterns. So it's kind of like, how do you connect groups of users offline with online? There's amazing patterns, and God knows what online. So it's actually connecting real-world experiences with what's available digitally. Um, and how do you get people online um, in their actual communities where they're actually participating in society in maybe different ways? So that's sort of some of the areas we're exploring. Uh, just, I realize that with my uh, angle facing, I won't see if there are any, any questions. Are there are there any questions at this point? Oh, we have one in the middle. Do you want to go ahead and uh, t tell us your name and, and, and where you're from, if you will, if you wouldn't mind as well? So the question, uh, if I can summarize, is, is to some extent is that uh, we've seen a lot of uh, democratization of the web in action in, in, in places like uh, the, the Middle East where these technologies were used to help obviously organize the protests that, that led to the... Of course. I could address that point. I think the, the, the truth is there is a fantastic crossroads going on at, at the moment. So yes, we have seen uh, you know, amazing outpourings of, of people power in the Arab Spring and, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, you're seeing uh, growing tendencies of, uh, among governments around the world to clamp down on the internet. So we see that in China, we see that in, in Iran and, and in other countries. And it's by no means certain how things are going to play out. And I, you know, I think we, certainly at Google, you know, we, we simply we have a very strong belief that access to information is a good thing for the world. It's, you know, it's been shown to be good for economies, it's been shown to be good for democracy and, and society. So we, we, we feel very strongly about that, but uh, it sometimes worries us that uh, people who take those freedoms for granted w won't necessarily stand up and, uh, and defend them. So you know, it, it's, it's a big battle going on for the for the, the future of the internet and the and, the, and uh, freedom of access to, to information. Yeah. And there's actually, uh, I guess, Liverpool is a place with a with a fairly interesting and, and perhaps proud people power past. So it kind of uh, I would I would. Uh, Put the the question back with Jenny. I'm curious as to um, I mean, why Liverpool. I mean, you know, why why bring the campaign here as a, um, as a because exactly as that you started with. It's one of the most uh, offline biggest percentage offline populations in the country. I found 100,000 people out of the population of 465,000, um, and we wanted to try and help the trickiest uh, and most complex. Um, set of circumstances as, as we best could but also crucially and this is that was half the reason the other half is because Liverpool itself was also working hard in this area and Liverpool Vision and the council and lots of local businesses wanted to do it and could see the benefit and it would never have worked if it wasn't out of the Liverpoolian population as opposed to imposed by us from somewhere else that was never the no, absolutely. Okay, uh, John, I'll, I'll just bring you in at this point because obviously you were involved in the uh, 
in the It's Liverpool campaign, or well, I suppose you you really led in, in creating it, and it's been, uh, if you will, co-opted uh, by Go On It's Liverpool. And and, and can, can I actually free, can you just summarize what, what what Go On It's Liverpool is actually uh, uh, about, if you will? Um, I'll probably start with the origins of It's Liverpool, and then how where I think the synergy is between the uh, the campaign and what we're here talking about today. Um, we're a creative agency who, I suppose, spend more and more time thinking about two things, um, issues around identity and issues around relationships. Um, a guy called Pat Fallon, who's a founder of a big American ad agency, once said, or said quite comparatively recently, it's time to embrace, embrace the public as co-marketeers and co-creators of brands. Um, and the point I think he was making was that new media enables the public to originate, uh, subvert, manipulate content in a way that previously was not possible and to become part of the way in which brands develop and uh, evolve their public persona. And I think there are big chunks of the advertising industry and big chunks of the commercial world that kind of recoil from that. Uh, and there are also those who I think become quite excited and exhilarated by the possibilities. Um, the It's Liverpool campaign was our response to a brief put out by Liverpool Vision, which was to develop a new framework for uh, branding and marketing the city um, at a time when um, I think there was a realisation that there was a kind of tragic mismatch between the way that the city had evolved, the way that the city was experienced by the people who live here, and the continuing way in which it's ex perceived externally by people whose perceptions are probably dated and uh, uh, no longer relevant. Um, I think what appealed to us about the brief and possibly didn't appeal to some of the other agencies who were pitching for it was we were told in very clear terms to begin with there's no budget for this campaign. Um, and I, it's a bit of a confounding challenge to be, to be given, but what excited us about it was it immediately meant that this campaign wasn't about providing definitive or prescriptive content. It wasn't about uh, the traditional mechanisms of outdoor hoardings or, or buying uh, space in print media or, or even new media, uh, and that somehow a different approach was required. Um, and fundamentally, what the campaign was about was, was a sense of identity and place which is something which is fundamentally democratic and has to be participatory and has to be owned by people. Um, one of my favourite misquotes uh, is from the Irish revolutionary leader Padraig Pearce. He said, the first imperative of the revolutionary is the reappropriation of language. Um, and I think the point he was making is that people need to be able to reclaim and remake their identity. And there is no greater denial of human rights than living in an identity that has been defined by somebody else. So. In a sense, what we were hugely excited about with respect to this campaign was the fact that, in a sense, we were giving the campaign back to the city. Um, in a sense, what we were doing was inviting the people of Liverpool, organisations, communities, to be the participants and the creators of content. Um, and that is really uh, how the campaign has evolved. Uh, the It's Liverpool, I'm Liverpool, we were, went to great pains to try to explain to people this wasn't a brand, there were no guidelines, there were no protocols, there were no rules. It's a bit of a gift tag. Uh, it's a package for uh, communicating surprises to people about the city's uh, the diversity of what's happening in Liverpool. But ultimately, it's an invitation to participate. Uh, and the participation has been almost exclusively through the web and social media. It's been through Flickr, Twitter, YouTube, uh, and it's been through images, photographs, films, including your rather brilliant film, Martha. Um, it's been through conversation, observation, comment, provocation, humour and exchange. So it has been a fundamental, it's, it's been an exercise in democratising um, the process of how a city explains, identifies and promotes it and presents itself. So I think there's an enormous synergy between the It's Liverpool campaign and the, uh, and the debate that we're having today. What's the advice you might be able to offer as a as a communications professional to, uh, especially one that's is is launched a, a, what I find a, a successful campaign with with no budget, which sounds familiar to uh, to Martha's challenge. Sorry, I'm so I was wondering what, what what advice might you offer to you know to 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 help uh, make sure that given hour and the, and the race online and go on its Liverpool continues to you know grow and be successful. And what I mean, what's the, is the 
is the tar is it five thousand digital champions in Liverpool alone that you're looking to to recruit, right? So, which is a substantial number. I mean, that's a lot of people to publicly make a uh, to, to pledge to give an hour and obviously make a difference in that hour. So. I'm, just any, any ideas off the top of your head, not to put you on the spot? Well, you're putting me on the spot, yeah, actually, sorry, Herb. Yeah. You are, <laughs> quite, quite outrageously. Um, and I, I wouldn't presume to advise, because I think what, what Martha is doing and, and the campaign as it's currently being uh, de developing, and, and the fact that you were able to fill this room today, I think it has captured your imagination. And I think the work that's been going on that we've been talking about and, and the pioneering work, I just wrote that down. I think that's a fantastic fact. Uh, and, and, you know, it's Liverpool, the world's first internet TV channel. Um, that was something which, you know, is a, is a massively under, uh, un undervalued uh, first within the city. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to offer ill-considered advice on something that I think is fantastically successful already. Uh, we've got about five minutes before we lose uh, Peter and Martha to to London. Uh, and uh, if if there are any other questions at this point, it would be good to uh, to offer them up uh, before before. If not, that's not a problem. We've got a couple. The, the person with the, the, the iPhone, or, or, or should I say, no doubt Android phone, that's flashing at me uh, at this point. Nice light question there, <laughs> uh, but very uh, very fair because uh, obviously the flip side about all this wonderful talk about democratizing is the flip side, which is that ultimately it's power. Power can be used for good, it can be used for for not so good things. Um, so uh, I think there were there was a question in there, and anyone willing, willing to want to perhaps chime in about the sort of the downside, the dark side of uh, of, of all this technology democratization. Well, I'll have, I'll have a little go about that. I mean, I think it, it, it really builds on what I was talking about a little bit earlier about the, the, the double-edged sword. And, and perhaps you know, the, the, the most lurid example of that is what we saw in, in Iran after the presidential elections there, where the, the, the authorities used um, uh, mobile phone tracking, et, et cetera, to, uh, to, to, for surveillance on political activists and so on. So it's, it's really, really important that that the web re remains open and people are allowed to to make the best of the services. And for example, there there are, of course, uh, we saw it in the, in the in the London riots and, and the, the riots in, in the UK recently, where you know the, the the government very quickly was moved to a situation where it was tempted to to shut down services, to shut down yes. uh, BlackBerry yeah. Messenger, yes. etc., um, and, and and very quickly uh, changed its mind and, and and decided not to. But it's, it's true that around the world we see governments, and not necessarily authoritarian governments, who are tempted to use technology uh, to, to, to stifle in, uh, free expression, etc. So, for example, in, in Australia, they, they, they looked at filtering the web uh, for, for child safety reasons. You know, so, th for, the, for the best of motives, they, are, they were thinking about putting in place uh, measures that would, would, would stifle the freedom of the internet. So I think we need to be very, very careful and very vigilant that governments don't uh, go down that path. Can I add one more thing? I think you raise an extremely interesting and hugely complex question that my brain is too small to answer completely, but the only other thing I'd add to Peter is just about transparency. You know, I think that we will never be able to prevent everything bad from happening on the internet, but what's really important in positions of democratic power is that the uses of the technology are transparent. So if the police are doing that, we sure as hell have all got to know about it. If Even if we don't have access to all of the different points of the information, being more informed about what they're doing. And I was looking at some photos that people had taken of uh, the rioters and then subsequently the peaceful protesters outside St Paul's recently. And, you know, even that small thing was changing the dynamics between us as a citizen and the police. So for as much as the police have that power, flip back, we can flip it back again as well. You know, there's some people taking photos of people being uh, pulled along the ground as their tents were trying to be moved, I think it was yesterday or this morning. So the power works both ways. Just think you have to keep that fundamental core about transparency right at the heart of any decisions. In a uh, slightly more, uh, I mean, that's a, the, the, the examples we've talked about are obviously are, are relatively extreme, but um, 
there's a, there was a cover story in Wired a few months ago that said the, the web is dead, uh, long live the internet, or something like that, uh, which remarked on the uh, and uh, yeah, the, the phenomena where uh, obviously the internet was built on on the principle of being a very open medium. Um, uh, the, but that increasingly, more and more, of that traffic is going back into these wall gardens. Uh, Facebook being an, an obvious place, uh, uh, the, the various Apple wall gardens as well, and, and things like that. And then, uh, you know, and obviously the the concerns about privacy and, and ownership of data and, and whatnot, uh, in particularly in Facebook, has been a topic that's that's come up a lot. On the flip side, it's got to be a major driver of 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 people coming on to, online and things like that. So uh, this is really out to the panel about what. What people's thoughts are with regard to this phenomenon about uh, do we uh, do we want to 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 militate, if you will, for keeping the the internet as open as possible, or do we need to accept that you know the likes of Apple and, and Facebook and others uh, are increasingly going to shepherd more and more of the population, the web the web, web traffic into these wall gardens? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And, no doubt you'll have some yeah, thoughts on this. I, I, think the, I think the editor of, of Wired has, has talked about his headline on a number of occasions and, and uh, admitted that it was uh, it was perhaps a little bit of an exaggeration and a, you know a, a compelling headline. But no, I mean we we feel very strongly that that it's it's, it's important to, to to keep the the web open and allow people the ability to to move their data around. So for example, we we have an organisation within Google called, called the, the Data Liberation Front, which actually works. Which is Google engineers, which actually work to allow people to to port their data out of services if they wish to to leave. So we 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 feel, feel very very strongly that it's important to to, to avoid wall garden, gardens and keep the web open. Any other thoughts? Facebook? Anyone want to take on Facebook or, yeah. or other such things? Well, I'll have a go. Um, how many people? Hands up if you're a Facebook regular Facebook user, like once a day, once every couple of days. Hands up. Keep your hands up if you've read the privacy statement in Facebook. Quite a few went down there. I think probably the majority went down. Now, one of the problems, of course, is that, yes, they are walled gardens, but the choice about privacy is very simple. We either stay offline, and to a certain degree, our privacy is much more protected, or we go online and, I guess, fall on the sort of either looking at our privacy statement or not. And obviously, a lot of people don't, so that's a big problem. And, of course, when things change, then you get very confused. On Facebook, you can do a lot of things to protect your privacy, but people just don't engage with them. So I think one of the obligations of, of software providers or developers is to make those things much more meaningful for people. It seems that people aren't engaged by their privacy until they find a photograph of themselves online that they don't particularly like. And then they, I mean, it happened to me. I got married a couple of years ago and my mother's best friend announced it to my friends on Facebook that we'd got married. We kept it quite secret, you see. And so um, that was the moment for me where I realized, hang on a second, people are broadcasting about me in a way that I didn't expect. So part of being online, I think, is grappling with that notion of privacy. And it's, it's one thing to learn the skills to be able to move from one place to the other, navigate effectively, but coming to terms with the complexity of privacy online, I think, is part of that skill set. I agree, and I'm just going to mention an organization that maybe you know here called Reputation.com. And Reputation.com in the US is growing, I think, you know, it's one of those hyper hyper growth stories of 50 employees two weeks ago, 500 this week, and they will manage your reputation online. So if you don't like your Facebook profile from when you were 17, they can wipe it and create you a new one. And they've got very smart engineers doing all kinds of clever algorithms, and that's okay as long as it's used benevolently, right? But that's pretty interesting development, I think. Yeah, and, and going back to your point about transparency, this is all, this is all about transparency and, and yeah. control, and we've, we've worked hard over the last couple of years to um, produce tools that, that, that allow people to, to see what data is held and, and to manage that. So we have things like Google Dashboard where you can look at the various different uh, Google products and, and, and uh, uh, your history on those and uh, manage that. In terms of, of advertising, you can, you can uh, control your preferences uh, as regards target, targeted advertising. And as I mentioned, uh, data liberation, if, if you want to leave a service and, and, uh, and uh, move somewhere else to be able to take that data with you. We, 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 before we, we, we let you go, we had one other question that I would see if we can try and sneak in that was in the middle of the... Do you, do you want to go ahead and... Yeah?
understand your question. you make a really important and interesting point and it's just beginning you know I think what I'd say is that my observation would be um, that the you know disruption happened around the commercial sector and it's just beginning to hit the public sector and the charitable sector but slowly slowly and you know it's changed forever in the commercial sector it's sort of more democratic but it sort of absolutely isn't there was no Google when we started lastminute.com and if you're not on Google now you do not have an online internet business and that you know no disrespect to Google but that raises some challenges I think and I think you are just beginning to impact that in the political system and the charitable sector too trying to raise money from individuals trying to um, raise difficult questions and it's changing all the time but we're really at the beginning of the journey so I would not a cop-out answer it's too early to tell to my mind it's too early to tell yeah, no, that's a very good point. Yeah, no, there are absolutely examples. Uh, on that note, can we thank uh, Martha Lane Fox and Peter Barron, who unfortunately have got to dash now. Okay, for two more. Just whilst Peter's leaving, my website was deleted from Google earlier this year. If you could, if you could help me with that, I'd be much appreciative. <laughs> Trying to find an intermediary that could help me solve that one is, is quite difficult. <laughs> what happened? Send me a note. I will. <laughs> what happened? I it had a malware problem with some of the pages. Some incoming links weren't very good. It I got it cleaned up though. And it's still not there. But. Um, but one thing I wanted to comment on that question was that, of course, public sector is very varied. I mean, if you look at, I know people who work in the BBC, and the BBC is a very good example of how there's no common policy for how to use Twitter. You look at a local level and the way in which it's being used, not just by editors or even from an editorial perspective, each individual is using it in a very different way around their particular campaign or their particular program. It seems to me that it's still an environment that is very higgledy-piggledy in terms of how people use them. And I think that's, that's, on the one hand, very good because it avoids a situation where, for example, uh, people or institutions regard a retweet as an endorsement, which is something I've heard some companies consider. You know, This is a, a remarkable thing. In fact, a couple of years ago at the Vancouver Olympic Games, the organizing committee regarded a follow as an endorsement from the company, which many people find quite peculiar. But nevertheless, that level of institutionalization of these platforms, I think, can often be to the detriment of the experience within them. Well, I think it's it's interesting uh, I mean, to pick up on the, the the point that was made earlier today uh, that uh, on 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 the one hand that uh, tapping deeper and deeper into these conversations um, is is being used uh, ostensibly to help to protect us from terrorism, um, but that obviously there's obviously the abuse of that power, which is to monitor into into conversations and things that perhaps should not be the the the, the you know with the purview of government. I, I mean, thoughts about, I mean, again, on this theme about the sort of the dual, the, 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 the double nature, if you will, about, about this power of, of a democratized uh, internet, a democratized web. I, is it something, I mean, that we should fear? And if we should fear it, what should we do about it? Any thoughts? Yes. Uh, I, I just really wanted to come back on the, the guy who was having difficulty um, getting his counselor to uh, respond to uh, interrogation. As, a, as an ex-councillor, um, and therefore understanding the kind of mindset of the politicians, I think they just recoil from any mechanism of accountability. And the more, the more extreme it is, I think, the more they 
probably don't want to engage with it in, in, in many respects. But I think there is, a, there, is a, there is a kind of paradox, and I don't have the answer to it, and, and I suppose I'm, I'm reversing roles here in posing a question rather than offering a solution. But it seems to me that what, what we've gained democratically in terms of an enormously enhanced power of scrutiny and accountability, it's almost instantaneous. I was in Ireland last week during the presidential election, and there was a 28% swing against the leading candidate in the last couple of days of the campaign because of his inability to answer a question about a political donation. And I think three times as many people saw the clip on YouTube than watched the original presidential debate. So there is this incredible way in which people's mistakes and misdemeanors can be found out and people are therefore empowered. But at the same time, it seems that the terms of political debate have narrowed quite hideously at the same time. And I think this is this this what this is this is where this issue around surveillance security becomes a, bec becomes almost an inevitability that there is this kind of diminution of, of democratic space at the same time that there is enormous expansion of opportunities for democratic participation, and within that tension, it seems to me that there's an almost inevitable way in which those in those in power and authority uh, will want to put some kind of a lid on a process which which is intrinsically threatening. And, and, and I, again, I just wonder about the extent to which the, the technology has helped to create this, this political consensus, which is now virtually global, and that the, uh, the, the internet, the, the new media technologies, are part of the kind of structural infrastructure of the neoliberal <coughs> economic settlement, um, because of the fact they're driven so much by commercial imperatives. They've been part of the process of economic globalization. Yeah, I've got a question to the person, the person that asked the question. How many tweets do you have? Just out of it, more or less. Yeah, how many, have you, how many tweets have you made? Thousands? And this councillor, how many does he or she have? Yeah. No. Yes. No, <laughs> I'm not sure which comment is appropriate after that. No, that's a really, really well put point, I think. Um, I find it very frustrating when commercial marketing or press officers get involved with that process. One, it seems to me that one of the good examples is, in fact, journalists and how they tend to operate within the context of their newspapers, where you do find editors and writers that are speaking through their own Twitter account under their own voice, and it presents no kind of legal problem for their employer. I think that that kind of system is, is one that could be followed much more effectively within politics to avoid this kind of ridiculous situation, frankly. Um, but it does come back to, again, one of the things that wasn't mentioned in relation to Race Online is that it's, it seems to be building up to 2012, the, the Olympic Games, and there's a drive to get it to that point by then. And one of the things that we've been involved with in the Northwest has been Media 2012, which is a project that uh, is not about getting people online as such, but about getting them to be citizen journalists and, and to engage with 
the kind of criticality of reporting content online, to think about what kind of things they put online, why they put them online, what kind of role they have beyond just their local community sp sphere and perhaps the political implications of their work. And uh, we found at previous Olympic Games that if you can do that in a way that's meaningful for communities, it can really transform people's lives. Uh, we set up two media centres in Vancouver and we accredited eight-year-old and a five-year-old to be a reporter from that media centre. And it seems to me that one of the really big needs is to try to address that role of the journalist within society today and to understand what kind of function that serves. And through thinking about the content, not just as... Uh, necessarily cultural or creative content, but also politically laden content, needs to be part of that discussion because otherwise you're reliant simply on those established mass media machines to produce the messages about something. Um, so what I would want from, from this kind of drive towards getting people online is to engage them with that critical discourse about what ought to be there. <laughs> that point and, and, and this is something we see commercially as well as probably with what's going on in government is that organizations are in disarray behind the scenes about what to do with social media which sounds really weird because I mean there's still a how can we control it and when we accept that we can't then we go okay who in our organization should be involved in trying to control it and um, which department should be involved so I think that um, when we're talking about individual MPs, it would be interesting to know, as you said, like, can an, can an MP speak without going through the traditional uh, means for getting sign-off on, on a statement or on a point of view? And there is still a fear uh, and a barrier to overcome for governance within organisations, whether they're commercial organisations or government organisations, to really understand what has happened as a result of social media what the barriers are um, and, and the parameters are for them as organisations to actually play, communicate and work within and there is still a lot of work to be done there before we can even get to the individual brand of an MP and, and what they do online. Um. A, a general question to the, to the panel, uh, which is that despite all this technology, despite all this, uh, this explosion and, and it's easy to get very kind of uh, euphoric about, uh, how, about how amazing everything is, is that we live in a time now where, you know, uh, that uh, people, I mean, obviously we're, we're, we're going through the, the aftermath of a financial crisis. Uh, people are talking about this generation of young people with the first generation of young people possibly ever that's lived worse than their parents have. Uh, that we're dealing with, uh, you know, obviously the coalition government is, is cutting left, right, and center, and they, they, they seem committed to stay on that path kind of thing. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering as to whether or not, and to some extent you think, well, why, why isn't our political, why don't our leaders use all this great stuff to actually make things better? How, how, how is it that things have got worse? And I mean, you, you talked about, partially about the point that it seems to me is that basically technology is outracing the capability of our particularly political leadership. But I don't want to just say just a, because clearly the, the, the head of all these banks, who seem like generally bright characters, uh, had no idea what the hell was going on. You know, I literally had no idea what was happening within their own multi-billion dollar enterprises. Obviously, a couple of major ones collapsed. And it is actually the bizarre thing, are we headed to some sort of societal collapse? Or I mean, it's perhaps a bit dramatic, but are we, is, are we actually creating a, a, a societal digital divide where the very people at the top, so is it hedge fund traders and people like that who really are perhaps understand, they're in the matrix, if you will, uh, they are creating a world that's that's very much to their benefit, and, and there clearly are people who are getting wealthier and wealthier as we're going to, not to get overly political about this, but it's, just, it's genuinely, just like, do we actually need to really think about slowing technology down somewhere? I mean, that's the magic word, slowness. It seems to me that the, the velocity of technology is being driven by the imperatives of the market. And, and the, the speed at which that technology operates is to facilitate economic transactions. And, and part of the process is, yes, it, it works democratically for uh, opposition, it works de democratically for protest, but it doesn't work very well for um, the development of a critical alternative. Because I think that requires a different process and a different tempo. We do need to slow things down, because I think if you are trying to think through an alternative to, to the current global economic consensus, which clearly is, is not sustainable and functional, then that requires a, a deliberation, um, it requires consideration, it requires intelligence, it requires space, and it requires 
a different pace of thinking and, and a different form of discourse than perhaps is facilitated through um, through through digital technologies. This is a, a personal opinion alert, but I think um, <laughs> the, um, the the modern politics as well. I think there's, there's sometimes there's a resistance to to engage in, in genuine debate, and I think what Andy said about that kind of um, social media tools being filtered through kind of marketing departments is that you know I'll know that my local councillor went to a Michael Bublé concert, but I might not know that they you know where they stand on a particular policy or a particular issue. So I think there is still that that tendency for it to be about you know public perception. And I think the the point that you made about the the Irish presidential presidential election my, my kind of reading in that situation as well was that it was less about the kind of um, the, the transaction that, that he allegedly made but more about how he, he just didn't conduct himself in, in, in responding to that that kind of line of questioning and then suddenly you know it showed up all these flaws and character flaws and you know that he he wasn't an appropriate appropriate president and then that that will run and run and run as a news story or it will be posted on people's Facebook pages or it will be tweeted about and then suddenly you know the, the kind of marketing around him as an individual you know, it falls apart. So I think that I think you know that kind of, you know, social media as a kind of genuine exchange, you know, of political conversation or debate. You know, I don't I don't think we are there yet, personally. But yeah, so. Yeah, I, mean, I think the thing, as well, when we're talking about slowing down technology for the way we live our lives at the moment, is look at what's happening in education. And when you look with young people at the technology that they're adopting and the way technology is so much is per so pervasive in the way that they are educated then it, it's scary to think what they're going to come out with and when when they come out of our educational institutions into the workforce where they'll be because I think there is a massive disconnect between we're talking about slowing down technology but you've got uh, a whole lot of people that will be coming into the economic sort of play in, in the next sort of five years that come from a very very different space to what we're currently debating. Yeah, please, yes, please, sorry, yeah. Uh, has made the argument that we should look to China, which is, is I must say, this is a first, uh, as an alternative model. Well, with the... to support it as a, oh, as a sorry. statement. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm making a statement that uh, technology is just neutral. It's just sure, okay. So the point was, uh, I suppose, with regard to China as a as a model where technology is adopted, uh, but controlled, uh, and and in a, in a, in a pro-capitalist society. So and, and and obviously one that's doing relatively well and becoming ever more powerful, and hence will almost certainly become the mo the the biggest and most adopted technology model that's out there. That's a very good point. Uh, sorry. Anyway. Just a quick comment on the slowness. If anyone wants to slow down my computer, you've got me to answer for. And and I think the the one of the problems we face is that, of course, anyone that's bought a new device in the last couple of years, you'll have got up to your counter, paid your money and think, this is going to last me a while, this new iPad, this new laptop. But in fact, of course, these things are pre-programmed to be obsolete within a few years and you'll have to replace them. Yet we still believe they're going to last us, you know, that investment of a few hundred quid or whatever it is, is going to be for the long term. And I think that one of the one of the interesting facts about our society today is that if you look across the technology spectrum, some things last a lot longer than others. So there's maybe an argument for, for these artifacts lasting much longer than they're designed for, and maybe a, a political campaign around the value of trying to increase the longevity of those devices so that we don't need to replace them quite so quickly, as, as indeed we keep our toasters for 10 years or our cars for 15 years. These, these things last much longer than those artifacts that we go around with every day. Um, but, it, but it seems to me with, we still believe that these things are going to last for much longer than in fact they do. And that's partly because the technology, the tools enable us to do much more. So if you want to record in HD now, that's going to put a much bigger pressure on your computer than, than a lower quality format. So we're buying into the fact that we're, we're hopefully getting something better for our buck, if you like. 
But um, one of the questions that may arise is whether we see that as peaking, whether in fact we need to, whether devices will ar arrive at a certain size and not change very much after that, because we're not changing very much in terms of our own dimensions. Uh, so the teleology of, of technology, I think, is still up for grabs, still open to question. Okay, well, following on for that, I mean, there's an argument that's been put forward that increasingly our, our technology is here to serve us. And increasingly, people are saying, are we actually living and working for our technology? Are we, I mean, are we building our lives? I mean, so you look at the lines outside of whenever Apple launches a product. And clearly, people have built at least that part of their life around being the first to get that product. And I fear there are probably a couple of people in this room that, that stood on those lines. And that's not meant to criticize anyone. Um, and in the amount of time, obviously, we're spending online, uh, whether it be by these, these smartphones and in Facebook, on Twitter, so on and so forth, where... And clearly, the people at Facebook, uh, there's a product manager there trying to figure out how to get you to click on a link that much more, or, or, or to message, use their platform for messaging, things like that, and, and really effectively addict us. And I don't, again, I don't want to sort of, I, I'm just, uh, for, for the panel, do we feel that, are we, you know, is, is, this, is, is this another downside to democratization, or just simply a passing thing we'll eventually remember to sort of, you know, get exercise and, and eat right and things like that? Any thoughts? Well, if, you get, if you get Wii Fit, you can do both. You know, so. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm just going to relate that back to the, the race online campaign, though, because you know the, even when you talk about that, that rapid acceleration of technology and you know and having to adopt new new forms and new you know so whether it's a desktop PC or a laptop or your mobile phone or an iPad, you know the, the end result is you're going to get online, but that experience of how you do it is, is very different depending on what what vehicle you use. So. You know, for the for the race online campaign, you know, it, you know, for someone who's never ne never gone online, it's it's like trying to catch a, a moving train. So, you know, it does it does make me think about the kind of, um, you know, the, yeah, that that rapid acceleration and whether you know this this you know you've got nine million people in the country at the moment who might then get access to a desktop PC, but in in, in two years time when something's moved on, is it is it that nine, is it you know have we renewed that nine million people and that that kind of that gap again? And think of as your point earlier on about that. The digital divide, but it was more digital literacy was probably the more the more relevant relevant question. But yeah, I just, just you saved that question till they left, didn't you? <laughs> Should we get a speakerphone and try and make a call tonight? I think, I think the issue is if people, you know, people should have the right to make an informed yeah. decision not to be online if they don't want to be, and that should be respected, and they shouldn't be treated as some kind of uh, freak or heretic for, for making that choice. I think what the campaign is about is ensuring people have the opportunity to make that choice. And of course, it is an inherently political campaign, not just in terms of the party, but what sort of thing do you drive people towards when they are online? Is it creating artistic content? Is it being part of some electronic voting poll? Where do we try to encourage people to be when they get online? I think that's, that's part of, part and part, it's disingenuous to suggest that that's not part of what we're aspiring pe for people when they try to get online. But one of the questions that seems to me is what sort of, Patrick raises what kind of device is appropriate, uh, and it seems to me that a PC maybe isn't the best best item to be be online with. I, mean, I think picking up on that, one of the things clearly is it is one of the big trend is the Internet of Things, and that's that's anything from 24 to I think 5,000 billion connected things by 2020, and then and this is something that Roy, you know, we 10, 15 years. It, 15, 20 years ago, we were out on the road. It was like when your Coke can's connected, when your fridge is connected, when everything around you is connected, and if you are online, everything around you knows you, then you are living in a web of data. And it isn't so much, it's about pervasive technology where it's not even, you don't even think about going online. And I think that that is where, as in terms of trends and where we can see some of society going, that's when it starts to get really, really interesting. And it's only eight years away. 
things and really you know digital technology and connectivity in particular being much more pervasive in our society so the internet of things just for uh, for I mean, uh, again I imagine most of the room knows is just this idea where literally uh, maybe not all but certainly many of the devices that we interact with are also online and that they communicate uh, with us and with each other uh, and do various things uh, uh, that to help make life more automated, different, better, and so on and so forth, uh, uh, so to speak. So, um, and um, I mean, we've, we're down to the last couple of minutes. So are there any final questions from the audience uh, or observations or things? Oh, sorry, didn't see you back there. Hold that for a second. Any other final questions or comments? That sort of. Okay. Oh, we've got another one. Yep. Please. different questions so to the panel uh, the one was obviously about um, not just encouraging encouraging consumption but also um, in being able to to obviously create some of the stuff uh, software and, and, and the such and such like uh, and the second question with regard to what's in, in this democratized web uh, you know, relatively few people uh, out there are actually able to make much of a living uh, do we think see things changing that would allow um, there to be uh, the, the economic basis for people to, to survive, if not thrive, going forward into the future. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to kick, kick off with that. Andy? I'll take the first one because I think that um, you know, the Race Online 2012, I think, is its full title. And of course, it isn't just about racing online to 2012, it's about staying online after 2012. And of course, that's crucial in terms of people getting to a point where they can produce that kind of content that would allow them to engage with those more creative, more often disruptive practices that you describe. So, of course, there needs to be a point at which you first have entry to the internet and be able to understand what it is and what's possible. But there needs to be what has always been the case with any form of technology. You have to be rooted within a community where you can continue to develop and hone your skills and indeed your understanding of the possibilities. And you take any, any user of any social media platform and each one of you here that's, that's part of one will be able to document your own unique trajectory through that environment. I no longer use Facebook chat anymore. I used to use it about six months ago quite a lot. And it seems to me that without that continuity, it's very difficult to get to that point where you can be critical and try to do those sorts of things that you describe. So the, the crucial thing for these sort, all these sorts of campaigns is to achieve what I think Tenant's been achieved, is to get to that point where you've got a community underpinning it that provides the ongoing momentum for people to have an incentive to be involved with it still, I think. Any other thoughts on the other question with regard to either future economic models or uh, with regard to making versus Versus consuming. I feel like everyone's looking at me there for this one, but um, I, I, 
I, the, the truth is, I don't know, and I think we, as an organisation ourselves, you know, we we do struggle with that, and you know, it's a kind of you know an ongoing investigation for us of how you translate that intellectual property or your your kind of, um, you know, the your kind of creative endeavours and and, and commercialise that. Um, you know, I think I think it's it's radically changed, obviously, from the kind of dot com boom areas, and I think that there, you know, there's probably still a lot of work to be done, and, and you know, to to kind of seek out those those business models so that they're not just um, controlled or, or um, administered by by massive of massive corporations, and you know, so I, I you know I'm, I'm watching the kind of record industry or the music industry with kind of um, you know with with some fascination really because I think that they'll you know they're kind of a bit more ahead of the game in terms of what what the kind of new models may may or may not be over the the kind of coming years. But I, mean, I think I think there's a lot to be said for the freemium model that you, some of you will be from. How many people have heard that word freemium? So a few people. So for those that haven't, the principle is that someone develops something for a bunch of people and some people get it for free and some people pay a bit of money to get a bit more functionality in their use of the software. And I think that that is a very important step towards democratizing software so that you can have an understanding of the software, be able to use it without having to pay anything. And there are lots of ways in which innovation is taking place online that still have quite a big impact. I think that's important to, to get across. Some of the things that have been developed online that are incredibly creative, that don't require much creativity from the end user, but that are, are really quite a big impact. One example is Prezi.com, P-R-E-Z-I.com, which is a way of presenting content through uh, screens and, and so on. These have really big impacts on people that haven't come across them before. And as a user, they're really simple to use. And you have free access to them. So here's a way in which someone can have, an, again, an entry point to perhaps developing their own creativity through software that's free, but also available at a cost if they want to use it in a much more professional way. So compared to, I think, 10 years ago, we're in a much more democratic position online, which is a contentious thing to say because, of course, there are these walled gardens. But I think that if you look beyond those walls, there are a lot of reasonably new startup companies that are doing really innovative things that are below the radar of, of most people, but are pushing the boundaries of what's possible to do in a digital format. Okay. Guys, I think we are running out of time, so I've got one last thing I'm meant to be doing. If anyone wants more information about that's the information about the Go On It's Liverpool campaign. Um, and um, I'd just like to thank uh, Patrick, John, Nat, and Andy for, for your time today and for a really interesting and very wide-ranging chat, I must say. Uh, I hope the audience um, as well. And thanks to, uh, to the panel. It'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, and thank you for your time and for joining us this afternoon. Um, and um, have a good evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>